So in their years as correspondents in China. That's after these messages, so please stay with us. It is now 16 and a half minutes past the hour. And in the mid-1930s, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, and others were the youthful leaders of, of a Chinese communist force waging a revolution from a cave area deep inside China. Now, Mao and Zhou had not yet emerged as major historical figures. They, they weren't doing very well, and they weren't very well known. But Edgar Snow was then an adventurous young correspondent uh, from the United States who spent most of the 1930s in China. He was the first Westerner to meet Mao and the first to write an in-depth report taking the Chinese communists seriously. And Mr. Snow died in 1972. His wife, during those years in China, was Helen Snow, also a journalist and quite a personality, I gotta add. <laughs> and five months ago, she went back to China to make a television documentary retracing the steps of her early years there. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. We're going to see some of that film. We're going to talk about your reminiscences. And before we actually look at the film, in which our first piece is going to show a cave in which Mao Zedong lived in 1936. And before we look at it, can you give us a little background on this cave? Well, this cave is in a very remote area. It's up near the end of the Great Wall of China, near Inner Mongolia. And actually, no one's ever gone there except five people before us this summer. So you see, it isn't a very well-known spot. But when Edgar Snow went there, it had, it had just become the seat of the new communist government. They'd come about 8,000 miles on the Long March. They went to this little area because it was already a communist area. Uh-huh. And here you are retracing those steps that Edgar took in uh, sight of one is, of the biggest scoops. This is Kim Considan, the producer of the television documentary. And we're walking through the cave, and that's the actual red color of it. In the background, you see a bed where Mao Zedong slept. Mm. It's made of a mud kong, a mud platform. And the only personal thing that Mao Zedong ever owned was a mosquito net. No one else had one that were very difficult to get. The reason for that was malaria. I see. Uh, so that isn't on the bed as far as I know, but he did own one. Now, I'm looking around at the furniture. It's a very attractive furniture. I love the chair. We can't see the chair, can we? I don't see it at this moment. What did you oh. love about it? Why? Uh, well, it's very attractive looking. It's not, see that? Well, oh, there. See how attractive yes. the chair is. Well, uh -huh. that's where Mao Zedong sat. And at this table, mm -hmm. Edgar Snow sat with Mao Zedong at night. They always interviewed at night during about four months in the summer of 1936. And Mao Zedong told him his personal life story. He never told it to anyone before, and he's never told it since. So it's a great story, and it's in his book, Red Star Over China, which is still read all over the world. It certainly and is. And especially in China. It's a big classic in China. And what is that now? Oh, those are a, a couple of metal boxes that were brought on the Long March 8,000 miles. But they, these are the archives of the Chinese Communist government. That's all they had within those two boxes. In other words, those were their filing cabinets. Their filing cabinets. Oh, my <laughs> word. What do you most vividly recall about your own conversations with Mao Zedong? Oh, well, I had the three or four uh, formal interviews with him, and I also talked to him a few times. Uh, well, the most important thing, I think, was that during that summer, he wrote his uh, magnum opus on contradictions. So when I went there, I brought a long list of questions, which I'd made up in Peking before I left for him. And they were so long that when he got it, he said, I think we should do a handbook. <laughs> and I said, well, that would he be He wanted great. the two of you to do a handbook? Yes, because I had all these long lists of questions. And in, among the questions were things which couldn't be answered. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, of course, you know, contradictions do exist. They're there. They're necessary. In other words, you didn't answer the question. He said, it's a contradiction. And uh, then he did write this um, treatise on it, which is very popular mm -hmm. among the American people in the 1960s. It's kind of an anarchist idea that there are contradictions, and you proceed to do what you, what you like. You don't become orthodox. You know, what you and your husband at the time did was so unorthodox. Do you, and in retrospect, I mean, do you know what it was about the two of you that, that allowed you to get so close to Mao and to the other Chinese officials? Do uh, you yes, know? it's a great mystery. Uh, now, in that cave was the most important uh, scoop that any journalist has ever that, had that I know of. That's right. Just to be able to interview and talk to Mao Zedong, because after that, he did not open up to anyone else, except to me a little, not mm -hmm. much to me. Well, we had a method. We called it method interviewing. 
and the Chinese are not accustomed to this. So the first thing you do is break the ice, you see. Now, what I did in China this time is I took a picture of my orange cat with me. And Your I, orange cat? <laughs> orange okay. Cat. So before I talk to people, I show them a picture of my cat, and that made us friends. It breaks the ice, you know, some kind of a little friendly gesture. Uh -huh. And you never, never ask any confrontational thing at the beginning. Actually, in China, you never have a confrontation because it isn't done there. You never break the surface. So we were very careful about that. And we established with them this kind of a rapport, which would be is a typical American thing. It's what you do here and what David Hartman does. You have mm -hmm. to know how to interview people without frightening them at the beginning. You right? go very gently. We did the same thing only in China. It's 100 percent that way. Huh. <laughs> very difficult. You know, one thing that I, we would like to show to the audience this morning is a photograph which we have of you making a delivery to Deng Xiaoping yes, in Washington right. last week of a letter, a very special letter. Tell us the story behind that. Uh, well, and let's see now, this is 42 years ago. I was in the little town of Yan'an. I was doing, um, I, I thought I might be a war correspondent. I didn't know what one was, but I thought it was a good chance because there was a war on. So I told Mao Zedong about this, and he wrote a personal letter in his own handwriting. It was addressed to the um, army at the front. Mm -hmm. And the deputy uh, of the political department of all the Chinese armies at the front was a man named Deng Xiaoping. He wasn't well known then at all, and I had never met him. But my husband had met him the year before and interviewed him. Didn't, he did say something about him. He said he's a little bit, oh my. <laughs> that letter was written in 1937? yes. And it was finally delivered yes. last week. And I'm sorry, we are being delivered of time cues, which says we are out of it.